that's certainly important. Okay, so today's veteran is, as I said, Joseph G. Bilby. Joe received his BA and MA degrees in history from Seton Hall University. He served as a Lieutenant in the 1st Infantry Division's 1st MP Company in Vietnam. Joe later retired as an investigations supervisor from the New Jersey Department of Labor and has for many years been enjoying a second career at the National Guard Militia Museum of New Jersey in Seagirt. An award-winning historian, he's the co-author or author or editor of dozens of books, two of which are on the New Jersey State Historical Commission's list of 101 great New Jersey books. So we're going to have a lot to talk about this evening. Joe, you all set? I'm ready. <clears throat> okay, great. So to start, can you just tell us the years you served in the military? Right. I, uh, I entered service in March of 1966, and I got... Um, off active duty in Jan the end of January of 1968. And then I was in the reserves for two years and then inactive reserves for two years. And then I was on my own. <laughs> okay. And specifically, when were you in Vietnam? I was in Vietnam from August the 24th of 1966 to August the 20th of uh, 1967. Okay. And your branch, unit, and rank while in Vietnam? I, I was in the military police. And when I arrived, I was a second lieutenant. Eventually, I got promoted to first lieutenant because I didn't screw up too much. And, uh, and I, um, my job initially was to escort convoys uh, of ammunition and supplies to fire bases and other bases. And uh, that was before we had armored vehicles to do that. I, uh, I just used to have a Jeep with sandbags on the floor and we were the first vehicle in the convoy, which was kind of just, you know, a little scary at times. But the day, day before I left, an armored vehicle showed up in the parking lot of the <clears throat> company headquarters. I said, what's that? And they told me, I said, well, that's nice. I'm going home tomorrow. So, uh, but then uh, the, the second part of my tour, I was, um, uh, ahead of a, a very unusual unit. It was uh, within the company. Our company, our military police company in the first division had a rifle platoon and a mortar platoon. And they used to perform infantry duties around the base and set up ambushes at night. And they were supported by the mortars. Now they were a mix. Mostly they were started off with all being MPs, but they kept replacing them with infantry guys. So, uh, and I was a friend of Andy Anderson, who was a first lieutenant, got promoted to captain. He was going home and he said, you want to take over the mortar platoon for me? I said, yeah, it might be interesting. So I did. And for very fortunately for me, I had a platoon sergeant who had taught mortars at Fort Benning um, AIT. And uh, so he was my guy. But we had a bunker and we used to the infantry. Every every unit in the first division had to put out an ambush platoon that included the band. So they would come in, the officers in charge would come into the, our, our uh, bunker and they would tell me where they're going to be. And we would plot some uh, cho choices where we want to fire some rounds if they needed them. And then they could adjust them by, by radio. So that's what I did for the latter part of my, my duty there. And then it, the, the, the infantry Lieutenant was a, uh, infantry platoon, the rifle platoon was led by an infantry lieutenant who was a friend of mine named Rod, and uh, he, um, <clears throat> he, he was a good guy too. I went out with him on one occasion to see what they did, and it didn't turn out that well. So. Oh, Joe, well, now I have to ask you to elaborate. Mm -hmm. uh, what happened was, I said, I was just taking over the motor platoon, and I said to Rod, Look, I'm going to be firing support for you guys if you need it. Uh, let me go out with you. And they did sweeps during the day. They, they were, and they, uh, so he said, yeah, sure, let's go. So we went. And with us was an ordnance lieutenant named Jim Leatherwood. And he had a rifle with a scope on it. And he'd invented this telescopic sight. And he was going along this for the hell of it to see what, if it worked. So we got off the deuce and a half trucks north of Tuduk, and we went into the 
woods and fields and paddies and and then we got to a rubber plantation and it, there rod called a halt and he said all right everybody you know get down and uh, i'm going to see where we're going next mm -hmm. so i was standing next to him and he got in his knees and looking at the map and suddenly and, and there was uh, everything erupted over us grenades going off and bullets cracking over our heads so we hit the ground and Rod said to me and, and uh, the gyms, take these guys here to the back. I don't want to get surrounded. So, okay. We went back and we went to a ditch. And uh, so it was quiet for a while, then more shots and yelling and hollering. And, and then I saw a, a VC run by and I started to go up and take a shot and an American stood, stood up in front of me and it was a, it was a mess. And, uh, and then, then it was over. So we went up. We had three guys wounded, and and there were three dead VC in the in the road. And uh, it turned out that they were being pursued by a, a a Vietnamese army unit with advisors, and most of the fire came from them, and it was going over their heads. And uh, so uh, uh, they, they we called in a helicopter that took out the guys who were were wounded and uh, and then we uh, we went on our way and then finished up uh at the uso and uh, zeon so uh, but it was a it was a scary day believe me <laughs> well joe that really gets everyone's appetite kind of whetted to discuss your wartime service but i do want to pause and back up a little bit because i always think it's so fascinating to hear a little bit of background on our vets and and how their early life impacts their service so for you you're a child of newark new jersey right correct tell us a little bit about growing up in newark well i was born during world war ii 1943 in september and my my father was drafted the following month so uh, he was a world war ii veteran when I was a little kid and I began to realize what was going on, we had the Korean War. So, it, you know, there, there were everybody's father, it seemed, had been in World War II. My best friend's old man was. He was a medic. And so it just seemed a natural thing. There was a draft. They had gone back to the draft in 48. A natural thing to serve in the military. And either the older brothers of people we knew were either in service or they joined the National Guard. And so, and it was, it was also uh, a, ver a very uh, diverse community. Uh, we were in the North Newark and we had, we had guys like Tony Soprano and, but we also had Irish guys and Polish guys. And we had a whole uh, raft of different ethnic groups mm -hmm. and uh, it was interesting. And as time went by and I was in high school and they still had the draft, uh, I got into Seton Hall and I found that if Seton Hall or Rutgers, both of them were all boys schools at the time. Both of them um, had mandatory ROTC for the first two years. So I couldn't afford to, to board at Rutgers. So I went to Seton Hall where I could take a bus and I was in ROTC. And that's where I met your, your, your host, your guest from last week, Mike Rowan. Mm -hmm. He and he, uh, got me into this military fraternity they had called the Triphibian Guard. So I said to myself, well, my old man was a PFC in the Army. I might as well be a lieutenant. I'm going to go anyway. They'll probably draft me after I graduate. So I went to, you had to be selected for the final two years. So I was selected, went to summer camp, which was like basic training, and in my senior year. And at the end of my senior year, I was commissioned a second lieutenant. Now, there's a little bit of a funny story here, I think, that you told on Wreaths Across America Radio this morning, Joe, about you get commissioned, but you also get drafted. Is that right? Oh, yes. Yeah. After I got commissioned, uh, there was a wait before I went into the Army. So I got a part-time job, and, uh, and then I get a draft notice. So I get on the draft board, and I say, hey, you know, you can't draft me. I'm a lieutenant in the Army. And I said, oh, all right. <laughs> Then I'll have to grab some politician's son. Oh, no, we can't do that. Yeah. <laughs> so how long goes by then before you are activated? I was I went on active duty in March of 66. So, and I actually, 
while I, I, I was in the class of 65, but I was six credits short, which I didn't know. So I had to go the uh, one more semester. Okay. So I commissioned and got my degree in January okay. of 66. Okay. And then I went to Fort Gordon, Georgia, which was a real uh, awakening for a kid from Newark in 1966. I mean, no pizza, no bagels, you know, it's all these rebels around, you know, so it was, <laughs> and I remember uh, stories my father told me about some guy in his, who from, from Tennessee in his unit who, that when he got his combat boots, he said they were the first shoes that anybody ever gave him. So, and I actually confirmed that speaking to the son of a guy who that was like that later on, many years later. So a little bit of a culture shock for the boy from yeah. Newark. <laughs> Definite culture shock. It was, and uh, you know, I, uh, I, 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 I didn't care for it. After I got through my officer basic course uh, and graduated from that, then I was assigned to Fort Gordon. I had orders for Vietnam. I had actually volunteered for Vietnam back in '65 because it wasn't really that big a deal then, and I, I had this delusion that I was going to write the great American war novel, you know, and surpass Hemingway. Mm -hmm. But, but I, I, I saw a schedule in Vietnam, but not until December. So I'm down here in Georgia and again, it's into the summer and it's hot. And it's a mess. And I call a guy in Washington, who's the personnel officer. And I said, gee, you know, I'm supposed to go to Vietnam. Is there any possibility I can go sooner? He said, Oh yeah, I think I can do that. And uh, that's when it started to build up because then we had, you know, the first division was over there and they weren't there quite a year yet. And this first cavalry, uh, first cavalry division was up in the, up in the mountains. So I, uh, I got my orders and I left, I went home, I had a month's leave. And then I got on a plane. First time I'd ever been on a plane in my life was when I went down to Georgia. And I, I got on a plane to San Francisco. And I remember we got, we got into into the waiting area for soldiers and and they looked at my shot record and they said oh lieutenant we owe you a lot, a lot of vaccinations here so they, we went through a line and everybody got shots and i think it was for ebola or god knows what you know bubonic plague you're going to the pacific huh oh okay you need this and so we went through there and then when we got on the plane then we went to we flew first to hawaii and then that's why I say I was uh, I was in Hawaii. Then then went to Okinawa, and then to Saigon. And when we were first on the plane, a lot of these guys had the shots were delirious. You know, I was okay, but uh, they were delirious. But then we land in Saigon. I get off the plane, and I, I the first thing hits me is the smell. Mm. You know, it smells like garbage. You know, and uh, we're at Tansumut Airport, so I, I go into you know they take us into where we're going to stay for a night. And I noticed a, a big hole in the roof of one of the buildings. And I am ordered hit that last night. I said, oops, I don't know what I got myself into here. So the next morning we get in the truck and we, we head up to uh, the first division, which is west of Saigon, about 20 miles. And uh, so I'm riding in the truck and I, I watch uh, the guy with the machine gun as a private sitting up there. And when he's like lazing around, I'm okay. But suddenly he gets alert and I say, oops, this is a good, not in a good place. Mm -hmm. So then we get to get to the um, first division base camp at Xi'an and, uh, and then up to the company in the, the next day. And that's when I joined the company. Hmm. Hmm. I want to back up just a little bit and, and dig a little deeper into your volunteering to go. So you talked about, <laughs> you know, writing the great American novel. And, and I assume there's a bit of adventurism there, but did you have any thoughts about the war from a political perspective? I mean, you told me earlier, you were reading everything you could get your hands on about Vietnam. What were your thoughts about the mission over there? I, I initially, I was for it. I said, hey, you got to stop the commies. It's the Cold War was on and all this. And then I started to, I said, I better, I'm going to go over there. I better read everything I can on it. Most of it was by Bernard Paul. It was about the French experience. And I began to have doubts about whether we could ever get out of this thing. Mm -hmm. and, and when I got there, you know, I, I guess it was like a few weeks later, I was taking a convoy, or waiting for a convoy on Route 1. 
and there was a, a, a South Vietnamese unit there and they were having lunch or something and all their guns were stacked. And I was talking to the sergeant who was the advisor. And I said, oh, they stacked all their guns there. He said, yeah, watch it when they, when they get up, half the guns will still be there because the guys are taken off. I said, oh, that's not a good sign. So mm -hmm. I, I, but I said, well, you know, I, got a, I have a job to do. I have a duty to do. I have a responsibility to the men under my command. And uh, so we're going to do the best we can. And we did. Mm. And this might sound like a small thing, but I'm going to tell our audience at the end about the exciting new exhibit that's opening at the museum in Homedale. And it's called There and Back, The Journey to Vietnam at Home. But the exhibit a portion of the exhibit talks about the bond between the soldiers and the flight attendants. Does anything stick out to you? Or do you remember the flight attendants, you know, as you're hopping your way over to Saigon at all? I do remember we were on a commercial airliner and there were uh, women, the flight attendants. Yeah. But I don't remember anybody, you know, talking to them. Yeah. Well, just, yeah. just thought I'd throw, that's not in my usual repertoire of questions. I just thought I'd throw that in there. Uh, so, okay, you get over to Vietnam. You've talked to us a little bit about your first impressions of Vietnam and your first impressions mm -hmm. of the South Vietnamese soldiers. What are your, tell me about the base. What are your quarters like? What are the facilities uh, there like? We started off in a bunker and then we got to a tent and then we ended up in, in a, what they call the hooch, which was like a wooden building with screening on it and, and a roof. And uh, so, uh, you know, you had a cot in there. It was, it was better than being in the infantry because in the infantry, you were out in the field a lot of times and you never got to change your clothes. You never got to shower. And uh, we were in comparative luxury to the infantry. Mm. Guys living in Saigon were even in more, more luxury. Mm. They live in hotels. And I have a story on that at the end. Okay. So uh, I, uh, it wasn't that bad. And, well, and when, when I took over the mortar platoon, I used to sleep up there at night. You know, I would sleep and then they'd wake me up and they were going to do a fire mission. So I had to supervise the fire mission. So I napped in between. And then with the mortars, a couple of nights, we actually fired support for a genuine infantry unit that was engaged in the VC. That was very nerve wracking. Because mm -hmm. the thing you don't want to do with a mortar is have a, what they call a short round mm -hmm. and hit your own guys. Mm -hmm. And that depends not only on you and your plotting board within the bunker, but also that the guy in the, up in the field is calling you the right directions. Yeah. So and the kid who was down at the gun is putting the right sight picture on there. So mm -hmm. there's three different ways it could go wrong. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, it didn't for us. So you already told us a little bit about the work you were doing over there, but especially for our students in the audience who might not have any familiarity with military terminology, we said that you were a lieutenant in the 1st Infantry Division's 1st MP company. Mm -hmm. Talk to us a little more about your duties, your responsibilities. Okay, well, it was it was it seemed awful kind of haphazard. <laughs> we had a company headquarters there, and you were given a charge of a platoon, but you never really, you know, didn't have a formation with them or anything. And and when they, they were assigned to convoy duty, you you took them and went with the convoy because you needed yourself and your driver and your gunner and we need another one for the rear and we need the guys to hold what we call tcps which are traffic control points mm -hmm. they would stop you know vietnamese would right run these little motorbikes right in front of a two and a half ton truck so you kind of keep them out of there mm -hmm. we had we used to get uh, some vietnamese qcs which were their military police and they were all pretty good actually mm -hmm. and uh Matter of fact, there was one a guy in a in a in this little Lambretta scooter who was trying to get across, and I was watching him. And the Vietnamese MPs were down there, and the guy took out a forty-five. The, the MP and shot the guy's motor out. So he didn't start edg edging anymore. So, but uh, yeah, and so and then of course uh, Rod had the rifle platoon, and he had missions to do. So it was all it was mostly connected upon whatever your mission would be. Like once they woke me up at midnight and said, you got to take a uh, 
convoy of ammunition and, su and supplies up to the Route 1 to Coochie. There's a big battle going on. It was dark. You know, in the daytime, when we never we never had tanks or anything like that for escort. We just had our machine gun. When I got up to the gate, I see there's five tanks there. So I said, oh, this is serious business. So we went out, we went up, we got to a place called the Hockman Bridge, which they periodically blew up and it was blown up. We had to bring the tanks and the trucks over this little rickety bridge that the 25th Division Engineers had, had made. And I could see flashes in, in the dark, in the distance, and that was the battle. Of course, I found out many years later that my friend Mike Ryan was up there with the 196 Light Infantry Brigade. So that, that's, is, that, is that a good summary of what we did? Yeah, yeah, no, that gives, a, especially the students, I think, an idea of what's going on. Um, yes, because one, one thing. Napoleon is credited with this, but I don't know whether he actually said it, but said amateurs study tactics, uh, professionals study logistics. <laughs> and you got to have ammunition, you got to have food, and you got to have water to keep the guys going. Well, speaking of studying, I want to ask you, how well do you think the training you received stateside, so that could be from ROTC, you know, officer basic, the training you received stateside, did it prepare you for what you had to do when you got to Vietnam? Well, I don't think anybody was prepared. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I knew my, I knew what I was doing. Let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. so, uh, I, I, it was, it was certainly adequate. Mm -hmm. You know, it was not, uh, and I remember one thing I remember of the officer basic course is they put us through the infiltration course. The infiltration course you crawl on your hands and knees across this ground, and there's places where they have dynamite that blows up, and they fire a machine gun with light over your head. So I'm crawling along, and, and I remember my father telling me that during World War II, they went through the infiltration course, and one of the machine guns was broken off its mount, and the guy was killed. So I'm saying, oh, good, I shouldn't remember that. <laughs> but I, I crawled up, and I saw this private who was just, not moving and i had to drag him with me to get to the end of the infiltration course but uh, that that was the, my biggest memory of uh, officer basic course did you feel like you understood how the missions you were executing fit into the broader american mission in vietnam oh yes as i said logistics is the thing okay our, our logistics our convoys were, were escorting logistical material, material that they could not fight without, ammunition, food, water. Yep. Uh, when I was in the mortar platoon and the mortar platoon supported the ambush platoons that were out all around the base camp uh, because they didn't want people um, you know, attacking us, so to speak. So there was a function there. And next to us were the Koreans in, the, in an old French fort and they were, they were tough dudes believe me uh and uh one night it was I, it was ted of 1966 and there was no no war then there was a truce and the the, the sky broke out with all kinds of rockets and things and it was the it was the koreans celebrating ted they were shooting stuff in the air but yeah i think um you know we on on the level that i was on the level my superiors were on. We did, a, we did, a, a, I think, a good job. Mm. Uh, it was an impossible task in the end yeah. to do what we had thought to do. Mm. Because they had plenty of reinforcements and, and logistical material coming in from the north through Cambodia. Mm. What do you do about that? Yeah, so. You said ultimately it became. But he was okay. in war. Go ahead. <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry. I was going to say, ultimately, it became clear to you that this was kind of a mission impossible. Um, yeah. Was that becoming clear by the time you left, or did you not realize yeah. that till years later? Yes. It, it, by the time I left, and I paid close attention on the news, and, uh, and then the Tet Offensive happened, and I saw it on TV, and I said, yeah, this isn't going to end well. I don't, I don't know. what What is our goal? Uh, you know, our goal is that they're just going to keep on fighting until we go away. Mm -hmm. and, uh, they tried to compare it to the, the guerrilla war the British fought in, in Malaya. 
And I wrote a paper about this in grammar school. I'm in grammar school. <laughs> and my MA, my MA project. And the Brits had Chinese guerrillas. And there were Chinese were a minority population in Malaya. Malays didn't like them. They, they all concentrated in the area around rubber plantations. And the Brits, then there was no way for them to get supplies from, say, Thailand, which is the next neighbor. And it took 10 years for the Brits to eliminate them. So here we are in an open border situation. And, you know, it's just going to go on and on and on. And I, 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 when I got home, I said, I'm not, I'm not anti-soldier. I'm not really anti-war either, but I just don't want to see guys get killed for nothing. Mm-hmm. Joe, while you were there, were you able to keep in touch with your family if you wanted oh, to? Yeah. Oh, yes. I, I wrote letters. And, uh, and uh, as a matter of fact, a good friend of mine in college, his sister, wanted to write to some in Vietnam. And she said, do, do, do you know anybody? He said, oh, yeah, Joe Bilby. So she wrote me letters and sent me books to read. And I wrote her letters back. And I met her after I got back. And we ended up getting married. <laughs> oh, oh, I love that. Do any of these letters survive? I have the, see, the letters she wrote to me, we were told to destroy our mail because, you know, the VC might get it. Mm-hmm. The letters I wrote to her, she saved, and I still have them. Oh, oh, I love that. So you've walked us through some, obviously, of your memories. Um, what are some other situations, experiences from your time in Vietnam that stand out in your mind? Um, well, I, I, I was in the mortar bunker one night, and I heard a loud boom. I jumped out, and I saw a mushroom cloud on the horizon. And I said, oh, my. <laughs> and it turned out they, the VC had blown up the um, part of the ammo dump at Long Bin. And so I went the next day, and I took a convoy over, and there was shells laying all over the place. I said, well, you can't go in there because that's live ammunition. And so I remember that distinctly. And then I remember we brought another unit in country. I think it was the 11th Armored Cav from, and I, I had my, half my platoon, this is in, in, back in September, October of 66, half my platoon would go to Saigon, and the other half uh, would bring, bring these guys, guys tanks up from Saigon. The other half would go over to a place called Bearcat and bring the troops in there and reunite them at, at Long Bay. So I, I used to switch off. Sometimes i go down to Saigon at night and uh, Sometimes I go to Bearcat. So uh, one time I have this captain, infantry captain, who told me he wanted me to bring this load of lumber over to Bearcat. And I said, it's five o'clock in the evening, sir. Well, I want you to do it. I, I said, is that direct water? He said, yes. So I'm back to the platoon. I said, all right, I'm asking for volunteers to go with me. So everybody volunteered. And we went down this winding road. And someone told me that the special forces abandoned it at night. We finally get down to Bearcat. It's dark. And a colonel comes to the gate. What are you doing, Lieutenant, out there? I said, well, Captain so-and-so. Oh, he did, huh? All right, get in here now. I went back the next day. The captain was gone. (laughs) But I was... So those those were memorable uh, experiences. And... uh, and then uh, going to R and R to Bangkok, and uh, you know, seeing the, the the marketplace and canals, and you know, all that stuff, the zoo. So that was that was good, and uh, can't think of uh, anything else momentous. Yeah, you know, uh, did there scary times with the mortar platoon. Though. One time we had all, we had a gun at every gate, and we had three guns in the company area. And one time, one night, I had all six of them fire. So we had instructions for each gun and, you know, as to where, where to, how to sit their sights. And that, that was very important because if, whenever you see a show on TV, a news report, and the mortar, the 81 millimeter mortar is almost straight up, that means they're firing close in. If the mortar tube is down, and, and that means they're, they're firing at a distance. So uh, 
you know, you, you have to, you have elevation and you have latitude. So, uh, um, you have to, have to know that stuff. Mm. Uh, I was never very good at math. So fortunately we had a book and I had a sergeant. So that was saving me. You told a simple little story this morning on Wreaths Across America Radio about having the transistor radio and hearing the Supremes. Oh, yes. Mm-hmm. When we went to convoy duty, going up Route 1, we used to hang a transistor radio off the machine. And I remember distinctly the Supremes coming on, <laughs> and saying, you can't hurry, love. And we just rolled along. We, you know, we were, Guy, the guy in the machine gun was dancing up and down, <laughs> and uh, that was Armed Forces Radio from from Saigon. We were chatting about this a little earlier before our audience joined us, Joe. How did people from different races and backgrounds in your unit get along in your observation? Well, I I could say I came from what was then a diverse neighborhood in in uh, Newark, and so I was used to that. I was Irish and English in, in my heritage, but my best friend was Portuguese and Italian. So it was a mix of all kinds of people. And one thing I noticed, and I have a picture of half my platoon, a photo, and everybody in there is different. There's a Hispanic kid from California. There's a black guy from Texas, Alabama, I'm sorry. There's a white guy from Georgia. And there's city guys, too. And everybody got along because we had a mission and we had to accomplish it. And they were good kids. And some half of them were infantry and half of them were MPs. And so I I was always said we should have some kind of a, the draft I think did a lot of civilizing people in the end. Uh, and I always said we should have a national service program for kids and, uh, and, and, the, and they get to know each other and they get to work with each other mm. and for the same goal. And then we have less problems with that cases. Mm. And Joe, how were relations up the chain of command? You know, a lot of people think of Vietnam and think of like the fragging and, but that's later, right? Well, yes. Although we had a major that nobody liked and somebody put a grenade in his his Jeep. Uh, No, I wasn't particularly fond of my company commander. Uh, and but you know, I wasn't gonna frag him, you know. <laughs> and uh, when he left, and the guy that took over as company commander was a guy I'd come in country with, and he had been just promoted to captain. And his name was, believe it or not, Robert E. Lee. And he had gone to the Citadel, and that, that was his his school. So we were pretty good friends. And, and so when, when my time came to go back, he said, Joe, you're not gonna stay in the army all right i said oh no oh yeah now he said well i have a deal for you i said oh tell me he said if you extend here for six months you'll go out you'll go you'll go home and be out of the army otherwise you're gonna have to station back there and i said no nah, bob I, I i i just feel a little a little nervous up here <laughs> and uh, he said well i can fix it for you i can i got a friend down in saigon and he can send you uh, get you in a company down there that you live in a hotel and mama son will shine your shoes every morning and you know you can have dinner in a restaurant I, said, I, don't know, John. I think i'm gonna go home buddy okay so of course had i taken that i would have been there in the middle of tet the mm-hmm. 5th mp battalion and i noticed on television the guys who were fighting for the embassy were the 516th mp battalion <laughs> Oof. Yeah. Hmm. So you talked to us a little bit about your South Vietnamese military counterparts, some hmm. better than others. How did you feel like your reception was from the civilians or, or did you not interact with civilians? Yeah, we did, because we had a, a lot of them work on this on the base okay. during the day and they called them the little people. And uh, if somebody was wounded, that was with them when they get back from the uh, from the hospital. That was the job they gave them rather than go out in the field again to, to herd the little people. And they had to clean the latrines. And they said, no can do, no, no like burn shit, no, number 10. <laughs> and uh, 
So, uh, but you know, they were they were fairly friendly. I mean, uh, but when they left every day, and I, when I was duty officer, I had to go out to the gate and um, and watch them. They, we had South Vietnamese women police and men police who would search them on the way out of camp. And occasionally they'd find somebody that had a couple cartridges in their pocketbook. Mm. So, and also, I, went, I had to go out there when I was duty officer. I had to go out there during the night. So I go out there and I'm talking to the kids who were manning the bunker. And I look beyond them and I see a monkey playing with a hand grenade. They had all these grenades and, and, and uh, uh, guns up on the deck. Be careful, there's a monkey behind you and he's playing with a hand grenade. But they all turn around very slowly. I said, don't scare him. And he put down a grenade and went out. <laughs> oh my Look, word. There are bullets cracking over my head in the company area. And there was a kid out there who was on guard duty. It was tonight. A Vietnamese man, an older man, was probably drunk. Came through the barbed wire and kept on going. This guy shot around his feet and finally he shot him. So when I got there, they, they were trying to revive the guy, but I saw the hole in his chest and he died there. Mm. Yeah, yeah I, I had nightmares about that for the rest of my life. And when I got back to, to the States, I was stationed at Fort Dix, which was great. And I went over to the Provo Marshal Office and I, they had assigned me to this track battalion that was scheduled to go overseas. So I, I said, I walked into Provo Marshal. I said, I'm going to pretend I don't know what my orders are for. And out comes Sal Chidicamo, a guy I knew from college, who's a lieutenant. I said, Sal, you got to help me out. I don't want to. He said, don't worry. I got, I got it. Take care of you. So I became executive officer of the MP company on the base, which was very, it was interesting duty. Good company commander, nice guy. Uh, used to love jazz. Uh, his wife was a uh, famous um, um, musician's niece. I forget how you who it was, but at any rate, I went to the program marshal office when I was an MP duty officer at night down there, and I, I met a sergeant I'd known in Vietnam, and he said, we still were talking, and he said, you remember that kid that shot that guy? And I said, oh yeah, vividly. He said, you know, he was here for a while too, he said, he never got over it. Mm. He was struck, and uh, yeah, so... Mm. So um, you told us that you were asked to extend your tour in Vietnam by six months and you politely declined. Right. How did it come to be your time to come home? How did that work? Well, they, they, you had a year tour duty there. Okay. And you could get out a little earlier. They had decided that they were going to switch the mortar platoon and the infantry platoon from the MP company because almost everybody in it was infantry over to the support command. And so I didn't have, a, you know, I, I, I didn't have anybody to pass the, uh, the, the platoon on to. So I applied for an early out and I got out four days early. So I was 351 days there. Went down, we went down, we went over to Benoit and I remember on the bus and uh, I was, uh, and we got on the plane and when we got the plane and it got up in the air, Everybody started cheering. Oh. And once we leveled out. <laughs> but uh, and we stopped in, where did we stop? We stopped in Japan. And then we stopped in Alaska. Mm. Then we flew from Alaska down to McGuire. And I had a, a friend of mine who I had advised, a friend of mine from high school and college, who was there to pick me up and take me home. And that was it. <laughs> I had 30 days to leave before I had to go to yeah, Fort Dix MP Company. Okay, okay. What do you wish more people knew about the life of the American soldier in Vietnam? Well, it wasn't it wasn't an easy task. I, I and I think few people today know anything about the military. I mean, because they've, they've never gone through basic training or any of that stuff. Uh, so I just wish they'd know that we just, you know, we weren't running around killing kids and you know, we were just trying to do our duty you know there are exceptions but the, most of us just wanted to do our duty to the country and go home and that was pretty much universal that that i saw 
did you feel that you observed any hostility towards troops returning home personally? No, what I what I saw or what I felt was, I guess, just they didn't want to talk about it. They were there, and we're in a, nobody was interested. Mm -hmm. I, I found I, I I came home and I had my my combat leader patches on and my medals and all that stuff, and we got to. Uh, my friend and I stopped to get a sub sandwich at Edison or someplace. And, you know, nobody, nobody, you know, like today they say, thank you for your service. Nobody said crap. And I got home and it was indifference at that time. That's then now we're talking about 1967. The following year, it really started to get, you know, nasty. So when I got home, it was just indifference. As opposed to hostility. Okay. You talked about having some nightmares. I mean, did you mm. struggle as you were adjusting back to civilian life? You know, it, it's a staged process for you. You talked about the reserves and then the inactive reserves, but was it a struggle to return stateside and, and try to get back to normal? I didn't, I didn't realize it at the time, but in retrospect, I do. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I drank too much and, you know, it was, it was just, fortunately, I, you know, I, a few years later, I got married and she saved me. <laughs> you know, so, uh, yeah, I, uh, but periodically I would, now it just seems like it's, it's very dim memory, but it gets vivid when I talk about it. I mean, it's like it was yesterday. Oh, oh. And do you find that you like talking about it, Joe? Actually, I do. Uh, you know, I talked about it to my son and my son-in-law. My son served as a captain in Afghanistan. My son-in-law was a, a captain in uh, in uh, Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, and they seemed to, my son especially, when he went to Rutgers, he, he enrolled in ROTC. I didn't tell him to. Mm. But he said he wanted to follow in my footsteps. Mm. So he did. But... Uh, and he's a, now he's an attorney uh, working for the feds. Have you ever been back to Vietnam? No. Any desire ever? No. No, I look at pictures, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, you, you have some great pictures from your service. I loved looking at the ones that you shared. Yeah, you know, the funny thing is, when I told you about that thing where we had the bullets flying over our heads and all that, I had my camera with me. And I was taking a picture of Rod looking at the map and I dropped the camera when I hit the ground and the camera broke. Oh, gosh. So most of them were from before that time. Mm -hmm. Well, Joe, we've been going for about 45 minutes. And as I promised at the beginning, I'd like us to pause so that we can allow the audience to ask some questions. Before I do that, though, anything else you want to add that we haven't covered? No, I think we covered it all. Yeah. Okay. So then I would invite our audience. You can go ahead and unmute yourself and ask a question, or you can type a question in the chat and I would gladly read it for you. So I'll give you a moment to find your unmute buttons. <laughs> Way longer than detergent alone. If you want laundry to smell fresh for weeks, make sure you have- Hello. Hello <clears throat> from Wentworth. Hi, how are you? How are you doing, Joe? Hi. Welcome home. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering, did you ever join any organization like VFW, American Legion, or any of those? Yeah, I was in the Veterans Organization for a while. Does your plug-in pay too fast? Years I joined the VFW and as a lifetime member. I figured I, my son did, and my son-in-law did, so I said I'd better do it too. Oh, so Joe, that's so interesting. Did you say you didn't join until that next generation joined? Yeah, initially I, I, I joined the, uh, uh, the Vietnam Veterans of America and my friend uh, Bob Hopkins was in it. He, he was the brother of a, uh, uh, a girl who was my, my wife's best friend in, in high school at St. Rose in Belmar. And uh, so we, you know, we hung out together a little bit and we, we swapped stories. Because he was still over there when I got home. He was in the artillery in 25th Division. I knew the exact spots where he was. 
and his parent, his parents, I would lie to his parents and say, oh, no, that's just okay. Yeah, he, he'll be all right. Mm-hmm. And fortunately, he was. Yeah. Now, Joe, while we're on the topic of veterans organizations, I've spoken with some Vietnam vets who say that they received a rather chilly reception from some older mm-hmm. veterans, World War II, Korean War veteran, as if their cause was not as noble or something. Did you encounter any of that? No, because I didn't join the PSW until uh, two years ago. Okay. Yeah. Most of those guys, now they're looking for people. Okay. <laughs> yeah. so you'd kind of stayed away from that. I did, I did. And well, it was one of the reasons, you know, and I, uh, of course, I respected World War II veterans. And, and you, know, the, you know, what did they do? Look at me as a loser because, uh, you know, because Nixon pulled us out of Vietnam. I, it, it was, should have happened a long time before. Mm. Mm. Okay. Thank you for your question, Ronald. Any other questions? You can unmute or you can type it in the chat. Joe, did your father speak about his World War II experiences to you as you were growing up? Yes, but he he only mentioned the funny things or the good things. And uh, you know, he, he, they landed uh, about a month after D-Day and went across uh, France and Belgium and into Germany and crossed the Rhine River. He was in an artillery unit. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and they ended up on the Elbe River in Germany where they met the Russians. And he said that they stopped in a little restaurant there and the war was over. And the German waitress said to them in English, she said, you'll be fighting these guys next. And he said, ah, no, no. <laughs> oh, God. Well, he had another story. After the war, they sent his unit down to uh, Austria on occupation duty, and they had a little POW camp there. They were putting Germans in until they processed them. And he was the guard. Uh, One night, the guy says, my wife and family are down there in that village down there, and can I go down? And my old man said, yeah, go ahead. He said, I'll be back in the morning. Boy, you could have gotten in trouble with that. Oh, my. He said, no, no, he was a German. They always do what they say. (laughs) So he told me the funny stories. And now what about you? Were you able to talk about your experiences to your kids when they were young or did that not come till later? Wait until I got older. Okay. You know, and then they, or if they asked. Yeah. I wouldn't not talk about it because I think we have a right to know history and I was part of it. Mm-hmm. So, Absolutely. I see that. It looks like an R. Anderson, maybe. Yes. Has yes. yes, thank you. I, didn't, I wasn't sure if you could see that or not. But uh, yeah, my son works for the New Jersey National Guard. He sent me a link. I never would have found you or heard of you if he didn't do that. And uh, Joe, it's just a real pleasure to listen to you talk. And you've uh, maintained your humble sense of humor through the whole thing. And I'm sitting here with a smile, even though, you know, my memories are similar to yours. I was a 95 B20, 68, 69, uh, from Benoit up to Chu Lai. And, oh, yeah. uh, uh, you know, everything you've said is just uh, brings back the good and the bad memories, but uh, yeah. you have a style that uh, gives me a good lift. And, uh, you know, I guess on, on, on the hard issues, a uh, couple of questions or comments, uh, I guess some of the audience might be a uh, student body, but the um, Agent Orange thing, number one, how it, how it was handled and how it's being handled now, kind of being packaged with the burn pit uh, legislation. And number two, uh, the discharge process that people should be aware of, you know, World War II, you were more likely to be discharged as a group, uh, whether it was your company or a platoon, you came and went together. And with the Vietnam, it was your d state came up and you were gone and somebody took your spot. And you may or may not have uh, ever seen those people that you were with for, you know, the duration. So um, just want to leave with that, but thank you. It was a- okay real treat. Yeah, what you said is correct. Uh, you know, it, it, it was much different than World War II because you came home alone. 
and uh, you were alone, unless you happened to know somebody who had been there. In my case, I did not. You know, I was walking down the street, uh, actually, in, in Newark, and, and one of my friends from high school came along and said, hey, what are you doing? Huh? I said, where you been? I said, well, I've been around. You know, so I didn't, I figured I'm not going to go into this. <clears throat> So that's interesting, Joe, about the discharge process. And what about that first topic, um, you know, comparisons well, between Agent Orange. Orange for your generation and the burn pits for Iraq and Afghanistan? Yeah, I did not um, uh, see much. They weren't using it that much when I was there. They were beginning to. And I remember seeing defoliated areas off the road when we were running the convoy down. Now, the poor infantry guys had to go through those defoliated areas. And that was, interestingly, we were on the Micheline rubber plantation and uh, the, the French were still there and then they, were, they had a swimming pool and everything. Else. <laughs> but no, Agent Orange was used much more intensively, I think, after 67. So okay. I, I did see some evidence of it, but not, not a lot. I'm so glad some new folks found us today and I'm glad you could join us. I put in the chat the link for the Vet Chat series. If anyone is tuning in for the first time and you wanna know more about our upcoming programs, you can find that link in the chat. I have a comment and a question in the chat from your good friend, Carol Joe. She says, does Joe have a message of hope for future generations on the importance of peace in our world? Well, yeah, uh, I don't know that it's achievable. Uh, you think it is at sometimes, uh, and then somebody else starts a war. Uh, I'm not that optimistic, uh, but I'm, I'm just hoping that it's not a World War II type scenario. Mm. You know, I, uh, peace is much nicer. Mm. <laughs> Here's another question in the chat. If history were to repeat itself, or if the opportunity presented itself, would you do it all again? Well, you know, people have asked me that, and I, I usually say no. <laughs> because, well, you know, the interview some 90-year World War II vet, and he said, I'd do it again. Well, he's not going to do it again. <laughs> you know, uh, putting me back in the day, yeah, I would probably, I, I, I would do it again because it was the way things were back then, you know, and the way I was. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it became part of me and made me what I, partially what I am today. I would not, I would not disown it. I would do it again then, not now. <laughs> <laughs> Joe, do you think we as a society do enough to remember and to support our veterans? I think in recent years we have. Because uh, I, I I went through a long period when nobody wanted to nobody wanted to talk to veterans, mm -hmm. and, you know it. Uh, you know, you meet another guy who was there at some time, and you know you you'd get along with him. And uh, but then there were so many people who were not there, and uh, so it wasn't it wasn't the same as like World War Two. What twelve million, thirteen million people sir? and and that you know we there you know everybody you know as i said when i was a kid and everybody told me it was in the, it was in the military in world war ii but not not with me no mm. but i think recent years has, it's been a little better mm. you know, some guys get annoyed when people say thank you for your service but i don't i don't well, Joe, I, and I'm sure everybody listening in, we give you a hearty thank you for <laughs> your service and well. thank you for joining us tonight. Thank so you. I'll give the one last opportunity for a question. Okay. looks like we're good. We're coming in right on time. I've got just a few last announcements. I want to thank our curator again, Mike Thornton, for trusting me to steer this program for him over the summer. 
our director, our director, excuse me, Sarah Taggart for her good stewardship of the organization. And of course, all of our trustees and volunteers. And of course, we thank again, Joe for his service and for sharing his time with us this evening. And thanks to all of you for coming. I'm delighted that we have some new folks um, who are just hearing about vet chat and I hope we will see you again. I'd like to invite you to stay in touch with the New Jersey Vietnam Veterans Memorial Foundation via our social media. We are on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and our website, which again is njvvmf.org. Our next vet chat with Rick Gefkin is on July 21st, third Thursday, again, same time, 7.30. And uh, in some very exciting news, I referenced this a little earlier, this Saturday, we are opening at our museum in Homedale, a new exhibit called There and Back, The Journey to Vietnam and Home. It draws deeply from veteran and civilian flight crew accounts. So they've got rare in-flight photos, uniforms, and ephemera that provide a seldom seen look at the bond between soldiers and the flight attendants who served with Pan American World Airways, Pan Am, uh, Trans World Airlines, TWA, and United during the Vietnam War. The exhibition also features a birthing compartment salvaged from United States Naval ship General Nelson M. Walker, a troop ship that was left virtually untouched since the 1960s. So it's going to be just this huge, impressive new exhibit, and I hope you can all get there to see it. You can find more about that exhibit and admission fees, hours, all that, all that other amazing info about the New Jersey Vietnam Veterans Memorial Foundation, again, on our website, njvvmf.org. So thank you, Joe. Thank you, audience. We hope to see you all again soon. Have a great night, everybody. Bye, Joe. We'll talk to you soon. <laughs>